Lily, thank you so much for traveling to our state of Arizona to tell the story of our founder, Ethel Percy Andrews. Oh, David, I'm happy to be here. I'm really, really excited to be here to be able to tell the story of AARP's history. And thank you so much for hosting me. Without a founder, we have no AARP. So we would like to, to ask you to tell us the story of this amazing woman uh, who not only founded AARP, but also founded another organization, the NRTA. Um, who was this person? You know, David, it's really interesting that you ask about the founder of AARP because to really understand AARP's current work, it's very important to understand the woman who had the vision of founding it. Uh, if you were to start with the story of Ethel Percy Andrus, she was born in 1884, which means that she was a woman of the 19th century. And then she would live until 1967. And by the time that she passed away at the age of 82, she had founded an organization that today has grown to almost 40 million members. What shaped this person? Uh, what, what was her vision, uh, her, her, you know, her motivations? Uh, what the type of uh, environment did she grow in that eventually shaped her and motivated her to do so much and to found these two wonderful organizations? David, that's a great question. Using the word, what shaped her, is the best way to understand her vision. I think like all of us, we are shaped by family values. I know that your parents must have shaped how you and your brothers and sisters grew up. For Ethel Percy Andrus, the story is that she had two incredible parents. Her father's name was George Wallace Andrus. And he and his wife, Lucretia Duke Andrus, had the two daughters. Ethel Percy Andrus had an older sister by three years, Maud. And these parents, you know, in the 19th century of America, wanted both girls to get an education beyond high school. And then they had the family values of giving back to society. The father taught them by example about how service, giving back, was important to him and his wife. And both daughters went on to really live that life of service. And then Ethel Percy Andrus grew up in Chicago. Even though she was born in San Francisco in 1884, the father wanted to go to Chicago to attend Northwestern University Law School. And so he took the family to Chicago. So it's not stereotypical to say Ethel Percy Andrus was really shaped by Midwestern values. And while she was in Chicago, she attended a school where there were incredible educators that also taught her that one person can make a difference. And then I can speak more about this later, but she also volunteered at Hull House, which is one of the very famous settlement houses in Chicago, established by Jane Addams. So when you think about all these forces, just like you said, that shaped her, it was family values, the people that she worked with and volunteered with, and then she took everything she learned and shaped her own life based on what they had given her. What was going on in those days in Chicago that began to create an impression on her about community, involvement? What, what was life like in those days? That's a great way to enter her life story because in the late 1800s and into the 1900s, Chicago was being shaped by a lot of migration. Immigrants were coming in. So it was a city growing very fast by the end of the 19th century. And so you have a family who's living in a city where it's noisy, dusty, and dirty. There are a lot of social ills. So women like Jane Addams, other community leaders, were realizing if they wanted to make social change, positive social change, they themselves had to do it. As a matter of fact, someone told me that for years at the Smithsonian, there was an exhibit called From Parlor to Politics. There, was a, a figure, there were figures in this exhibit at the Smithsonian that were sitting around, you know, they're sitting there having cups of tea, and they were symbolizing the community organizing that was happening, where people realized if they wanted to make change, it was up to them. So basically, 
uh, she, she was a witness of a lot of uh, needs, uh, an environment of immigrants, uh, poor people, the settlement houses. So, so all these kinds of things are shaping her. They're, they're giving her a perspective. And, and I would even say, a, you know, a calling. You know, that's a great way to frame that. It was a calling. What happened was Ethel Percy Andrus attended high school and got an associate's degree. The place that she was attending was Lewis Institute. And it was really visionary. It was technically America's very first junior college. The concept of community colleges now in our 21st century is very important. Amazing. Yes, because they wanted to teach students an actual skill. So these students would attend the school, Lewis Institute, and you know the previous generation had been taught Latin and Greek, but this generation needed to learn a trade. So Ethel Percy Andrus was there, and then she was so good. She went on to, uh, such a good student, she went on to the University of Chicago and got what was their bachelor's degree and graduated from there in 1903. And then because she had such you know, high skills and was very talented, the Lewis Institute faculty invited her back to join the faculty as an instructor. She would remain there for about six or seven years. Now, back in those days, was it common for women to, be ed to get educated, to get degrees, to become teachers, or was that something uh, more like a challenge? Ethel Percy Andrus got the values of a higher education from her parents. But you're right, society was very very limiting at the time. Maybe the only two professions open to women would be nursing and teaching. Mm -hmm. So it's been said by women who knew Dr. Andrus that her sister Maud did go on and get married. But Ethel Percy Andrus, because she wanted a career, chose to become a teacher. And I was told that you know teacher women teachers back then, if they got married, if they were going to have children, they were often they could be fired because the thinking was that the job, a, a paying job, should then go to the man who would be earning money to keep a family. So in order to become an educator, she made a conscious decision not to get married. So I think you're right. Um, she was a pioneer. She was able to become an educator and then also still volunteer and work in you know, a very poor and very hard part of Chicago. And she did that until 1910, when the family returned to California because of her father's ill health. And they then settled in Southern California because the weather was better. Could we say that this was the formation years for her in Chicago? Then she gets her degree. She's, uh, she teaches for, for uh, I would say, about, what, close to six years? Yes and then moves back to California, where I, uh, I assume that a lot was awaiting her, almost, almost like, a, like a, the, real, the real thing now that she had been, if you will, formed, trained. Yeah. She must have had already a lot in her. She has seen a lot. So it's almost like she's coming back to, to put to, to good use all those, all those good uh, qualities. That metaphor is perfect. What happened was, as you know, she had to start all over again. When you go to a whole nother city, even though she was originally from California, she had to start reapplying to become a teacher in the school district in LA. And, but what is so interesting is when you think about a person who is just a natural born leader, she gets back to California in 1910. And we know from California history that she became in 1916, a few short years, the very first woman named to run a high school. Think of that. Not until 1916 would this very big state allow, quote unquote, allow a woman to run a high school. They could run, you know, they could be a principal of an elementary school, middle school, but they gave it to her, Ethel Percy Andrus. And if you think she just got back to LA in 1910, to be able to rise above the rest of the crowd be counted as a leader, be known to be effective as an educator, and then to be named the very first woman in that big state of California. That means she was a pioneer and a leader. 
back in those days, uh, you know, in California, what type of environment did she find, uh, you know, in that school? I don't know how good a student you were, but sometimes I got in trouble and got sent to the principal's office in school, uh, David. What was so interesting was she was given a school in East LA. It was called East Los Angeles High School. And if you think about how this woman understood psychology, you know, she was taking everything that she'd learned from these very effective activists, really, in Chicago and applying it in a whole nother context. So what happened was she got there and she realized she'd been given a school with a lot of juvenile delinquency. I hadn't realized that in the early 1900s, that was a big problem. And so one of the students said later that, you know, she spent more time in juvenile court sort of bailing out her students than actually at this high school because she realized these students were not given a lot of potential opportunities. So think of this. She gets there in 1910 to Los Angeles, becomes the first woman high school principal in 1916. And so by that fall, she is the principal running this very complex school, a very big campus. As a matter of fact, this school still exists today in East Los Angeles. And of course, when we say East LA, we know immediately how diverse it is. Even back then it was. So what happened was she said, okay, East Los Angeles High School, this is not going to inspire my students because literally down the street was the smokestack for the East Los Angeles brewery. Mm. So a woman who knew the power of words and the power of shaping a vision for students immediately renamed the high school Abraham Lincoln High School. Think of that. A woman who had grown up in the land of Lincoln mm. realizes the symbolism of this 16th president of the United States. So then she sets about turning the school around. She realizes, well, the reason these students were getting into trouble was after school they had nothing else to do. There were, I think, 29 to 30 languages spoken at the school. A lot of what, you know, American schools are facing today. Immigration, diversity, problems with families that were low income. So the first step she did was she created after school meaningful service opportunities, which meant, number one, she started things like Glee Club. You know, now we're seeing this television, sh television show become so popular, Glee. Well, she started drama club, Spanish club, Latin club. She had ROTC on campus. So that got the students out of trouble. And if you think about it, she was there from 1916 to 1944, 28 years. Many famous students graduated from there. In the class of 1926, she had both Robert Young, who would go on to become Father Knows Best actor, Marcus Welby, MD, but also Jose Limon, who would grow up, you know, he's the oldest child of Mexican immigrants. I think there were like 11 children in his family, but she gave him a vocation. He had a passion for the arts, and he would go on to found this incredible modern dance troupe, which exists still to today. And then later on, she would have another student, Robert Preston, who would become a famous actor and would become the star of The Music Man, the musical. So the point was she gave the students a leg up. She gave them opportunity. As a matter of fact, on the campus to this day, there is a wrought iron gate. And many students remembered that in order to enter the campus, they had to walk under that iron gate. And the woman who knew the power of words had had built over the arch of that gate the word opportunity. So many students would recall years later, they'd say, we walked through that door of opportunity. Who knew that opportunity had red hair? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Dr. Andrus was an Auburn colored hair, um, a woman with Auburn colored hair. So the point was, she turned the school around by giving these students a purpose. And then she realized, as many of the settlement house founders realized, you are part of a community. And so she then went to work on bringing in the students' parents. She realized many of them were immigrants, first generation, 
not really understanding what American life was all about. So she did what we would now call vocational training for the parents, lifelong learning. And so this incredible Lincoln High School became this destination, a center of community life. And to think now, if you drive through that section of LA now, the school is still there, and that area taking its name from the school is called Lincoln Heights. It seems like uh, Ethel found diversity in Chicago yes. and diversity in California. Yes. Uh, I mean, she could have, she could have, uh, she, she could have just taken uh, a wrong approach, uh. but I think she took the right approach. I mean, isn't that impressive? I mean, the, the how she embraced both in Chicago and in Los Angeles, she had an attitude of, of a very positive and a very embracing uh, attitude towards diversity. You know, David, your work here in AARP Arizona is going to be so key in carrying on Dr. Andrews's vision. I had not realized, and you can teach me this, how diverse East Los Angeles was then and still is now. But if you go to this high school, you can actually see all of the yearbooks. They're still there. And to flip through them from the years that she would have been there, 1916 to 1944, you see how the faces, the students' pictures, were becoming more and more diverse. So in essence, she saw the changing face of America. And I later found out that she did so much to make it an inclusive, you know, inclusive environment, honoring each student's background, but still realizing that together we're trying to build one United States of America, that she would um, honor their parents, she would bring the parents in to teach about their own cultures. But most important is she realized with the changing face of America that everybody could contribute to American society. And there is a beautiful testimonial to this. As I said, Robert Preston was one of her students. And as soon as he heard, you know, he'd become quite a famous actor, but as soon as he heard in 1967 July that his beloved principal had passed away, he sent the fastest thing then, which was a Western Union telegram. And in it, he wrote out, I've always been disappointed that our large, agglomerate, multiracial world could not function as happily and as well as our small, agglomerate, multiracial high school in Los Angeles did. But then our poor world had no Dr. Andrus to run it, Robert Preston. We have talked uh you know, touched uh, upon different uh, aspects of the life uh, of Ethel, but we haven't uh, reached to AARP yet. So it seems she already did a lot, but uh, the good, I guess, is yet to come, so to speak. That's really a great way to put it. You've hit upon the real tipping point of the story. You see, if she'd already, you know, done so much as an educator and then passed away, she already would have had so many people remember her. The living legacy is in her students, you know, 28 years worth of graduates, you know, people who went off to fight in World War I, then, you know, close to World War II. But the story continued, and this is exactly why, without Ethel Percy Andrus, as you beautifully said, there would be no AARP. What happened was, as I mentioned, she was at Lincoln High School for 28 years. Then she faced a very tough decision, which we boomers are facing right now, our parents are aging, sometimes they're not well. We still have to work. What should we do? It's a very tough dilemma for many of the boomer caregivers. So in 1944, Ethel Percy Andrus faced that very same decision. She was already at that time in her 60s. But then her mother, who was still alive, was becoming more and more frail, needed a caregiver. And Ethel Percy Andrus said, I cannot let somebody else take care of my mother. Family must take care of family. So she made a very tough decision and decided to retire. So, you know, a career of 28 years, three decades almost, but she retired. And then what was so fortunate was her mother got better. So Dr. Andrews, a retired woman, realized she had time on her hands, so she did what she'd always done. She signed up as a volunteer. And she signed up with the Southern California Retired Teachers Association. And they made her a volunteer position was 
director of welfare. And so then how do we get from that point on to AARP? What happened was one day a grocer, this is a true story, I actually interviewed Dr. Andrus's original secretary and she's still alive and had told me that Dr. Andrus was given an address by a grocer and the grocer said, Dr. Andrus, you're the director of welfare. I have not seen this lady for quite a while. Please go and check on her. And so Dr. Andrus in the Southern California area went to this address and didn't find anybody there by that name. And then the people then later told her, oh, maybe you mean the old lady out back. And Virginia Schott said, Dr. Andrus, years later, telling this story, would still get so angry. So you see, what happened was Dr. Andrus literally went around towards the back and found a former, a retired teacher, a former teacher, reduced to living in a chicken coop. Mm -hmm. And you think of that, the 1940s. This would have been a generation, you know, because mostly women taught, of women who had lost money in the Depression. They were mostly single women. If they wanted a career, they were single. Medicare, which insured older persons, would not come into being until 1965. And at that time, no, no insurance company was willing to insure an older person past the age of 65. So once they had an illness after retirement, they would have to pay everything themselves. They were lucky if they even had a pension. Many retired teachers never even got a pension. So that perfect storm of financial insecurity reduced this one lady to living in a chicken coop. Mm -hmm. And you could say that was what galvanized Ethel Percy Andrus to action. She herself had realized, oh my goodness, you know, I'm retired, but this, fortunately California retired teachers did get a pension, but she realized it was so meager. And then she realized, oh my goodness, there's nobody advocating for the plight, the real misery that these retired teachers were living in. So that's, you know, from 1944 on, she's a volunteer. So she did everything that she had been taught by those social activists in Chicago. She realized she ne needed to get collective voice. So she thought to herself, and, you know, with the other retired teachers that were trying to help her, well, there are all these retired teachers associations across the United States. For example, CRTA, California Retired Teachers Association, was already in existence. So she realized the power of collective voice. If they bundled together all of these separate state-level retired teachers associations, then they could be stronger. So in 1947, at the age of 62, she would found the National Retired Teachers Association, NRTA. And then, you know, when you're storytelling, you have to take it further. How come there's an AARP? Well, thousands of people wrote to her after they realized that NRTA was helping retired teachers. She went around and tried to get a group health insurance plan. Now remember, Medicare did not come into being until 1965. She knocked on the doors of literally dozens of insurance companies. They all said, nope. We're not going to insure older persons. That's not smart to do. Until finally one company did agree. They did a pilot plan, and it was so successful that they were able to offer it in July of 1956 to NRTA members. The first time ever. So this is also another thing that Dr. Andrus should be known for. She knew the power of collective voice, meaning bundled together these separate state associations for retired teachers. But she also hit upon an interesting factor, the collective power of going into the marketplace to demand a better product, but also a product that can actually change the world. You know, to found an organization that would offer by 1956, nine years before Medicare came into being, an affordable group health insurance plan for older Americans. That was so innovative. And then because these thousands of people wrote to Dr. Andrus and said, you know, I'm not an NRTA member. I'm not a retired teacher. I'm not eligible to join NRTA. Can't you please first, 
you know, established, found something for us. And that's what in 1958 she incorporated in July in Washington, D.C., the American Association of Retired Persons. And by then she herself was already age 72. Amazing, amazing, amazing. You know, she, she's done, she did so much. Um, I am sure that the uh, retired teacher's community must uh, feel pr uh, proud, those that know the story, must feel proud of Ethel Percy Andrus. Uh, you know, because she basically founded the NRTA, you know, the, a yes. very, very important organization for retired teachers. Yes, and her legacy um, in NRTA survives to this day. NRTA is part of AARP, and we are so incredibly proud of the fact that the RTA units, they're like the equivalent of AARP chapters, help us do a lot of our volunteer work also. But let me now tell you about the chapters because only AARP Arizona can claim the number one AARP chapter. How did that story start? Well, as I said, you know, by July of 1958, AARP is incorporated. And meaning incorporated because she understood the, the power of being in the national capital. She, even though she was from California and even at the time was based in California, she realized the seat of power in American social history is our nation's capital. So she realized that a national presence was important. But this woman, who was a community organizer, really, a community activist, said, we've got to have other opportunities for our members, number one, to help us understand what's happening out in America, but also then represent themselves as community members. Yes, I belong to ARP nationally, but I'm also plugged in to my community. Because she actually wrote in one of her essays, what we're so lucky is, um, David, that Ethel Percy Andrus not only was the founder of AARP, but she also had a vision. I think it's so logical. She's an educator, a former teacher. She knew information is power. So within a few short months of founding AARP, she actually had out a bi-monthly magazine. We still have it to this day, AARP the magazine. Back then it was titled Modern Maturity. And in one of her essays, she had a wonderful quote. She said, our community is the place where we can be most effective. And so she hit upon this idea of having people join AARP nationally, but also having a local presence. And what that became was AARP chapters. And in September of 1960, she actually traveled to Phoenix, Arizona to hand this certificate, the Articles of Incorporation, to AARP chapter number one. And in the 50 years since 1960, our chapters have grown. They've often helped us on service, community service volunteer projects. They've really nurtured incredible talent that would go on and become AARP volunteer leaders, up to even the AARP board level. Chapter presidents have actually been nurtured up to becoming AARP national president. And so nobody other than AARP Arizona can claim number one. Good. <laughs> you know, she was uh, uh, very much devoted to education yeah. uh, herself. You know, she got her degrees, and now she has this magazine to inform members. Yes. Amazing. You know, David, I know that you love the concept of education and being informed. Well, she understood that our members vote. You know, the older Americans are the ones who go to the polls. So she always said AARP is going to be nonpartisan, non-governmental, non-profit. But our, because our members need to be informed voters, she knew that information is power. Only a teacher would know this. So there are really four key principles, four key strengths of AARP. And we can begin by saying the first one is education and information. Only a teacher would make that the first strength. And she realized a second strength of AARP would be volunteerism, that sense of giving back to society. So you have education and information. The second one would be service. There's many words now, David, using um, the latest uh, vocabulary. It could be giving back, civic engagement, volunteerism, 
community service, or AARP has a new national initiative, which is absolutely incredible. And it springboards from an essay that Dr. Andrus had written. We call it Create the Good. And then the third strength would be the fact that AARP's founder herself became an advocate. AARP might, might be well known for being a very strong advocacy organization. It comes from the fact that our founder herself, when she was trying to advocate for all those retired teachers in California, made her way to Sacramento, the capital, and walked the halls of the legislature to make sure that they understood what she was fighting for. And there's also a very interesting sidebar that one of her students, when she first got to California, at Manual Arts High School, so Manual Arts, you know, vocational training, was Goodwin Knight, who would grow up to become the governor of California in the very era that Ethel Percy Andrews was an advocate for retired teachers. So I'm sure when she was in Sacramento, she went in to see her former student, and I'm sure that he must have helped her. I'm still doing research on that. And the last um, very effective strength of AARP, which we continue to this day, many of our members and the public might see on television some of the commercials that our service providers have about AARP's services and products and programs. And what was so neat was, as I said, in 1956, to be able to found this incredible, affordable, accessible, healthcare plan on a national basis, health insurance for older Americans that nobody would insure nine years before Medicare. So in essence, Dr. Andrus pioneered a very innovative business model where we can be nonprofit, nonpartisan, and non-governmental, and yet still meet the needs and the wants and the needs and the desires of our members. So it's very appropriate that in 1993, when Ethel Percy Andrews was inducted into the National Women's Hall of Fame, the category was in business. So a social activist who pioneered an in innovative business model. I can only imagine the influence that she was uh, in her time in the country. You know, today ARP is a, a you know a, a big influence in the life of this nation and I, I'm just as I hear you I'm I'm sure she was a, a, a subject that people talked about ARP at the Percy I mean she must have been a very very important person a person that people heard a lot about you are truly trained in community organizing and community outreach David because you knew then that beyond being effective at the community level, the word was spreading about what she was doing. I have proof of two things. One, it's actually in Time magazine. Can you imagine a national, impressive, well-regarded magazine in the May 10th, 1954 issue in the education column had an article about what Ethel Percy Andrews was doing through NRTA. So, you know, if you remember, 1947 was when NRTA was founded. By 1954, she was of such stature that Time Magazine covered her. And it's a beautiful title. That entire column was the title was The Dignity They Deserve. And it talked about what Ethel Percy Andrus, one woman, with all the help of these retired educators across the United States, was doing to help older Americans who were retired teachers. Then there's a second proof, which is really very, very impressive. When Ethel Percy Andrus passed away in July of 1967, it was then the administration of President Lyndon Baines Johnson, and he actually wrote on White House stationery a beautiful letter that spoke to the impressive work that Ethel Percy Andrus had done. And it was so poignant in many ways because he said, in Ethel Percy Andrus, humanity had an untiring friend, a trusted and untiring friend. And then he would say that through her many accomplishments in what she was trying to do to make lives better for older Americans, that she was helping succeeding generations of Americans. So he knew that she had done something, literally started a social movement for, first of all, a positive image of aging, 
that older Americans, once they retire, or once they make a life transition into older age, should not be just, quote unquote, sent out to pasture. They had so much to give to society. And then also that she herself was the best role model of how she could found an organization which today almost, you know, 38, 40 million members, when she started it literally around a kitchen table in 1958, would be a dream that our members would say that today's ARP is here for me as a member. Having to do your research to learn more about our founder, how has that affected you personally in who you are? I think what has taught me the most in being able to understand the Ethel Percy Andrews story is that one person can make a difference. And not only do I now know it from, number one, her life story, but I see the difference here, especially in AARP Arizona, with the incredible volunteers that you and the team have, have invited to become AARP, part of AARP's family. So I've often said that anybody who understands the Ethel Percy Andrews story, the AARP story, they really want to just jump up and start joining us in our work because it really is something that has made a difference in the lives of older Americans and their families. So another way that it's taught me things about how one person, one woman made a difference is I'm a generation of women who have benefited from everything that the generation of women like Ethel Percy Andrus did. They've made it easier for us. Back when many women did not even go to college, Ethel Percy Andrus, AARP's founder, got a bachelor's degree from University of uh, Chicago. She would then in 1928, so this means she was running a very complicated, very big high school, would believe enough in education that she herself would go on and get a master's from the University of Southern California in 1928, and then a PhD in education in 1930, also from USC. So here we are in the 21st century where everybody realizes the importance of what we now call lifelong learning. That it isn't just after high school, it isn't just after college that you can close the books forever. She pioneered the concept for older Americans of lifelong learning. She actually had an institute that AARP would sponsor in Florida, California, and Washington, D.C., called the Institute of Lifetime Learning. So what has inspired me about her own life story is, number one, the, the one thing that everybody across America, of all races, of all ethnicities, and across the world, the one thing that we all have in common, if we're fortunate, is we grow older. And so she then gave us a new model of growing older, which is age has opportunity, it has opportunities for service, giving back, it has opportunities for intergenerational work. Only an educator who knew about students would understand AARP's ability, opportunity to work across generations. So that when we work on Social Security, we've often partnered with younger organizations because we realize that it's not just about our members, but it's about their children and their grandchildren. And so this woman who died in 1967 in my life today still shapes my vision of what I can do going forward as I grow older, but also that each and every day I should have her concept of service in my mind to give back to society. And so I will close by saying, think of this woman who left us a clue that today we still honor her. The original logo, the original seal of AARP had an eagle, and in the talons of the eagle, there was a ribbon. And on that ribbon were three key words, dignity, independence, and purpose. She wanted our members to age with dignity, with independence, but also to live with purpose and give back to society. So I would say that is one of the biggest lessons I've learned from working on learning about ARP's history, preserving ARP's history, and then sharing the story, is that by joining AARP, you're really part of a social movement 
begun by one woman to show that older Americans, older persons across the world have something con to contribute and also something that we can, as younger people, learn from. She did so much. Uh, she, was a, she had a vision. She had a pioneer in life. She, uh, you know, communicated with uh, the members through that uh, Modern Maturi magazine. She had volunteer opportunities. She was involved in education. She was involved in advocacy. Um, you know, she just did so much. And I really want to thank you for sharing all this with us. And I know a lot of people, as myself, will appreciate it. I have to say that after being with AIR for seven years, yeah and learning about the history and the story of Ethel, she's, she's now my hero. I really, really uh, admire Ethel Percy Andrews. I look forward to the history that AARP will continue to make in taking on Dr. Andrews' legacy into the 21st century. Thank you.